everybody. One of the great things about Patrick Brown no longer being in the race to replace Aaron O'Toole as the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada is that the other more serious and less scandal plagued <laughs> candidates have a chance now to advance great policy ideas, things that matter to conservatives and ultimately matter to Canadians without being overshadowed by Patrick Brown and his many, many scandals. And one of those candidates who is advancing some, I think, fantastic policy ideas is Roman Babber. He was, as you know, removed as a member of the Ontario PCs for his principled stance against lockdowns and COVID restrictions. And he joins me right now because he is releasing his commitment to Canada and he's going to walk us through it. Roman, thanks for joining us on the show. Um, why don't you uh, explain to us why you felt the need to, uh, I guess, put pen to paper and and document your commitment to Canada? Look, um, I've enjoyed this race. And I also think that it's been a very positive race in that it's been a race of ideas. Contrary to the traditional allegation that conservatives are afraid to put forth a bold and, and principled stance uh, during leadership races, I wanted to spark a conversation on, on some things that really matter to Canadians. And, and some of those, uh, I think, are long overdue. Uh, I'm running uh, against socialism in Canada. That's why I think it's appropriate to suggest that we should end equalization payments uh, instead of continuing uh, this provincial interdependency. We should probably phase out supply management instead of telling uh, farmers how much dairy they can produce. And we need to have the courage to stand up for all Canadians and defend them against uh, Bill 21 and Bill 96 in Quebec and so on and so forth. I, I think uh, we should make this race about the conscience and the future of the Conservative Party. And that means not being afraid to put forth uh, bold and courageous ideas. Now, you've got a, a, a sort of a four point plan of your commitment to Canada. And the first one is defend Canada's democracy. And, you know, not only in there do you, you talk about decentralizing powers away from the prime minister's office. Um, and I suppose that goes back to giving power to the MPs to exercise matters of conscience without being booted from caucus. Um, but also, does I, I suppose that involves giving powers back to the province too to make decisions without meddling from the prime minister's office. Absolutely, so so look, the, the principal reason why I'm in this race is because I think we're watching an unprecedented erosion of Canada's democracy. And as someone with a unique perspective on how uh, precious and fragile our democracy is, uh, I think it's incumbent on us to stand up for our country and, and all Canadians. So first, I will end this 21st century segregation that we've been seeing for the last couple of years. I'll pass federal legislation to ban all passports and mandates and medical discrimination. Uh, I'll restore the freedom of speech. That's the most important thing we can do because through speech, we protect all other rights. So I'll repeal the liberal censorship laws. I'll defend regulated professionals. I'll speak to the social media giants through the Bureau of Competition and ensure that Canadians are not censored online. And most importantly, we have to ensure free and independent media. And that means end all media dependency uh, on government. But at the same time, you can't restore democracy in Canada without restoring democracy in the Conservative Party of Canada. So I'll restore parliamentary democracy by decentralizing power away from the PMO, allow free votes on matters of conscience, and encourage MPs to express their views uh, without fear of reprisal. You know, I think that's a, a really great thing that you're talking about, that um, free speech is, you know, it's the thing by which we argue about all the other rights. Um, and, uh, we, you know, I was talking to Ezra the other day about um, one of the great things about Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is that he is unafraid to use all the levers of power at his disposal to advance his agenda. And we see the left do this all the time. Justin Trudeau does it all the time. It's how he banned 1,500 popular models of Canadian firearms. He just did it. Now, I disagree with his agenda, but he's using all the levers of power to advance it. And it's nice to see a conservative talking about doing the same, saying, you know what, I'm going to advance and pass this legislation. I'm going to get it done. Instead of conservatives being afraid to advance ideas. We always talked about, um, you know, the, the left talked about Harper's hidden agenda. 
10 years later, 15 years later, I've never seen it. <laughs> We're still looking for it. Um, it was so slow and hidden that nobody ever found it. And the left is always up front. At least we, we may disagree with them but we know what we're getting. And it's nice to see a conservative like yourself talking about it. One of the things you, I think, is a new policy to you is uh, the repeal of supply management. Now, as a farmer, I've got a unique perspective on this. I'm not a supply managed farmer, so I don't, uh, I'm not, I'm not pro supply management. If I can make it, they can make it. Um, But I think this is a new policy for you, or at least I've never seen you talking about it. Um, so why is it, why now, why are you talking about this? Why is this a, a Roman Babber issue now? It's just to your earlier comment very quickly, we do not need to be afraid of, of presenting a, a serious uh, proposal and, and agenda before Canadians. Uh, I think that that in fact is what lost us the prior two elections is that we're afraid to be ourselves or we run to the right during leadership and then we pivot to the left uh, during the general election. That is uh, inconsistent with our brand. We need to ensure that the Conservative Party stands on principles. And and folks might disagree with me, uh, but that's okay. That's democracy. But at the very least, you will always know where I stand. Uh, Like I said at the outset of the interview, I'm running against socialism in Canada. And that means that uh, I do not believe that we should have central planning of the economy. And I can't imagine a more quintessential policy that plans the economy centrally than supply management, whereby effectively uh, a Politburo of sorts, uh, the Dairy Council of Canada, uh, regulates how much dairy products we may produce every year. I find that terrible for the consumer, uh, of course, for prices, especially when prices are, um, are skyrocketing in the grocery stores, we are spilling out thousands of uh, gallons of milk uh, when we need to encourage increasing supply, not decreasing, especially given that uh, we have uh, a lot of money in the economy. And so I think that if a Canadian wants to get up and farm, uh, we should not prevent them. Of course, uh, I understand that some folks own concessions and quotas, and we need to figure out a way to wean ourselves off supply management. And that means maybe looking at amortization, uh, looking at some sort of exchange uh, policy, but I want to free uh, our ability to farm. You know, I I think that's great. I I think very rarely people think outside the box on this issue. Uh, And, um, you know, it's nice to see that you are addressing those arguments where they say, well, I have a quota. This expense, this quota is expensive. You're, you're rendering it useless to me you've actually sort of thought a little bit down the road about how we're going to deal with people who hold these quotas so that eventually there will be more farmers in the marketplace um, to bring those costs down to consumers. I think it's wonderful. Um, One of the things that you're, sorry, go ahead. I I was going to say, absolutely. We cannot devalue someone's personal property. We cannot come in and overnight render it, uh, uh, render it uh, uh, without any value. Oh, sorry, devalue it overnight. And so what I propose we do instead, we have some models to look at. New Zealand has been able to wean itself off supply management. Uh, but most importantly, I think we need to think about the long term. And we have too many cartels in Canada, whether it's maple syrup or agricultural products. Uh, we're limiting the supply of uh, fertilizer, for instance, uh, through a cartel, which makes no sense either. We need to free up our economic opportunity, especially at a time when we're seeing an unprecedented price inflation. You know, one of the policy issues you talk about in your commitment to Canada is standing up to China. And again, that is something that I have not seen a lot from the other candidates. In fact, I would... Uh, I would, I think, credibly accuse one of the other candidates, Jean Charest, of being at at least some point in his career in the pocket of uh, a CCP-linked company named Huawei. But you have said that since you were born under a communist regime, you really understand why people, particularly people from China, come to Canada um, to have their rights protected. And um, you're going to make sure that some of those Chinese style policies uh, of, you know, uh, hijacking intellectual property, um, cracking down on religious minorities, you're going to make sure that they never come here, but you're also going to speak out against China doing it. 
Um, and I know a lot of candidates, they're just scared because of the sheer economic force of China to say these things. Again, we should not be afraid and we should project moral clarity on issues that are important to Canadians. Uh, like many of your viewers know, I was born and I lived under a communist regime under the first almost nine years of my life. And uh, I recall the fear of religious persecution that my family uh, experienced uh, being uh, Jewish, uh, part Ukrainian and, and part Russian in the former Soviet Union. And so I believe that communism is evil and we must confront such evil without fear. And so uh, my government will stop pandering to China and will rally the international community to oppose uh, their onerous lockdowns. They're still locking down tens of millions of healthy people. They're oppressing uh, religious minorities. Specifically, we know that they are uh, transporting uh, Chinese Muslims into uh, camps. They're stealing our intellectual property. They have taken over uh, effectively Hong Kong's democracy and they're threatening Taiwan. We need to work with uh, countries around China and encourage the manufacturing flow to some of the neighbors in the region. And we need to rally the international community to stop pretending that uh, China is, is not one of the worst uh, human rights abusers around the world. And, and in fact, a regime that is destabilizing the world and lead the international community to this moral clarity. I wanted to ask you, and I know it's not in your policy document, but you've obviously thought about this issue, so I'm I'm going to ask you about this. You touched on the treatment of the Uyghurs in China, and there's some strong overlays between what's happening to the Uyghurs and the residential school system here in Canada that the Liberals speak out against. I think most people disagree with the treatment of uh, Canada's Indigenous people in the residential schools, but right now in China. They are taking uh, Uyghur children, preventing them, them from speaking their language, practicing their religion, and taking away their Muslim names, basically sending them to these re-education schools for little children while their parents are off in the re-education camp and the forced slave labor camp. And we don't hear Justin Trudeau talking about this at all. He rightfully speaks out against anti-Muslim racism and bigotry in Canada and around the world. He invited the entire world to come to Canada when Justin, or I'm sorry, when President Trump imposed what the left called a Muslim ban in, in with his immigration policy. But we don't hear about this systemic racism and genocide against this Muslim minority in China. Why do you think that is? I think uh, Justin Trudeau is weak and, and lacks moral principles. Um, this is not the only issue on which he's hypocritical. But to go back to this issue, when every year um, we use the phrase never again, we should mean the words never again. And I am very hesitant to make all sorts of historical comparisons. Um, it's something that is very, very sensitive to many folks. But it's for that reason that we need to be open-minded and appreciate what is transpiring in China. And of course, we know that the only religion allowed in China is communism, which is, and so it's not new for them to oppress religious minorities. We know, for instance, the Falun Gong people, the Falun Dafa people, something that I take a considerable interest in, um, effective practice, a, a form of meditation with breathing, with uh, yoga techniques and, and some spiritual uh, enlightenment. And, and they have been oppressed and jailed since the early 90s in China. They have been uh, used uh, potentially in all sorts of uh, markets around the world that are just unthinkable. And I think we have a duty as loving and peaceful people to uh, speak for human rights all around the world I don't propose an, interventional po an interventionist policy, but I do propose that it, we project mor moral clarity on, on such important issues. You know, it's it's interesting that you brought up, you know, the Falun Gong and the fact that what's happening to the Uyghurs, it's 
happening to other religious groups in China as well. You rightly point out that communism is the only allowed religion there. For example, Cardinal Zen, he's the cardinal, the Catholic cardinal of Hong Kong. He was arrested in May, May 25th. And uh, he has been an outspoken advocate for a free Hong Kong for a very long time. And it has been an absolute failing of the Canadian government to speak up on his behalf. Um, there's a Canadian singer was also arrested at the same time. Um, it was not just Cardinal Zen, but again, Justin Trudeau, too scared of China, and as you rightly point out, has no moral clarity and has been completely silent on this issue. The man is a political prisoner based on his religion and Canada, who, you know, we used to take the lead in these issues. I think we were instrumental in dismantling um, South African apartheid. And we are completely silent on this. Absolutely. I, I think part of the issue is that uh, over the last couple of years, we have completely taken our eye off the ball around the world. Uh, we have been focused on COVID response, which, as you know, I'm, I'm a big critic of because I felt that we need to reassess our, um, our COVID response and, and focus on where the risk is, which is primarily in long-term care homes and, and congregate settings and beef up our hospital capacity because the virus is so transmissible. Uh, a rest of the virus, I believe is naive, but it's not just the Chinese regime that uh, Justin Trudeau refuses to stand up. I believe that one of the greatest threats to world peace and stability is the uh, Republic of Iran. And I remember after uh, the Ukrainian plane was shut down with 158 Canadians on board, uh, I remember he met with the foreign minister about a month later and effectively bowed to him. Um, I joked at the time that, that he was Justin's uh, Valentine. And I'm very, very concerned about the fact that Canada is unwilling to, to play a, a key role and, and project uh, this moral clarity and, and delineate for the international community, uh, right from wrong. And, and, and that's something that I think Prime Minister Harper did very, very well. And so I certainly look forward to restoring uh, such credibility around the world. But I wanna stress that we're not going to restore our credibility around the world until we restore democracy at home. And, and I wanna come back to the fact that we are seeing a remarkable erosion of our rights. We still have close to 20% of Canadians treated like second class citizens. We have censorship legislation working itself through the courts, uh, through, the, through parliament. We have uh, an unlawful invocation of the Emergencies Act. We have the top police officer in the country potentially doing the prime minister a political favor. Uh, I would propose uh, at least at the outset to focus on restoring democracy at home before we can credibly opine on what's transpiring around the world. You know, you're you're right to say that because uh, so often we see, you know, Chinese politicians and bureaucrats, they chirp us <laughs> online all the time. Um, and they probably have, you know, at least the ability to point out some serious hypocrisy by the Canadian government <clears throat> on some of these things. I, I suppose it would be pretty hard to speak out against Cardinal Zen when he didn't say anything when James Coates, Pastor James Coates, was sitting in prison in Canada, or, you know, speaking out against political prisoners while Tamara Leach is still in prison. Um, now, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about that sort of sets you apart, even amongst your own conservative colleagues, is on the issue of environment and climate change. Because I, as I'm reading through your policy document here, you note a very mainstream, reasonable uh, I think it's a pretty accepted fact here that Canada is a carbon sink, <laughs> that, that we actually soak up because of the size of the boreal forest more carbon than we emit. And yet Canadians are still being taxed on their carbon emissions. Uh, do you think, I, I guess my question is, are, are you going to uh, face some criticism for just saying this very acceptable mainstream scientific fact that most kids in grade 10 biology understand? We cannot be afraid to talk about some of the difficult issues that, that are facing our country. And I think that um, if anything we learned from the last couple of years is that it was our fear to stand up to the left-wing cancel culture COVID mob 
that has allowed this remarkable catastrophe uh, to go on for almost two years. You know, I, I said a couple of days ago, we somehow we allowed uh, government and public health and our school system to convince our children that if they play that if they play next to one another in close proximity, that someone, God forbid, may die. We have uh, we're raising a generation of children that have suffered a mental trauma, who will have difficulty potentially leading a normal life, and and we should not be afraid to confront those that seek to further uh, potentially, uh, whether it's purposefully or not, to inflict harm on our country, on our on Canadians, and our on our economic interests, and we should not be afraid to address. Uh, the discussion around the environment and climate change, but take it hand on. Canada produces only one and a half percent of all global emissions. Uh, it's even if we were to cut all of them, it's not clear that it would actually make any material difference in the climate. We know that most nations uh, are now giving up on the Paris Accord. We know who the polluters are. Um, I, I think it's a pie in the sky that is not attainable and not necessary, which is why I'll take Canada out of the uh, Paris Accord, and we're blessed with so much forest, as you say, that most, if not all, of our uh, greenhouse gases are actually naturally absorbed. Um, that is why I oppose the carbon tax. I do not believe that taxing Sally $10 at the gas pump is actually going to affect the global climate. I don't think that anyone uh, really believes that anymore, and I will not impose a regressive tax on Canadians, which achieves nothing other than effectively punishing Canadians and making life more expensive. So, uh, you know, right now we're planting 360 million trees a year. Uh, I will look to increase it uh, to maybe half a billion, but I think that uh, Canada's natural resources are a blessing. It's one of the themes of uh, my commitment to Canada is to make Canada a natural resources superpower. And that means repealing the anti-pipeline bill, um, rethinking, legislating, and negotiating the three main pipelines and revisiting the discussion on Excel. Americans are very unhappy with the price of gas. We clarify the duty to consult, uh, encourage the uh, creation of refinery capacity, and uh, reconsider our approach to mining and, and invest and encourage mining. I, I think the only way we get out of the fiscal hole that we're in right now is to unleash our economic superpower, and we can do that through Canada's natural resources. Yeah, you see in your policy document, you are making sure that you don't leave Canada's Indigenous communities behind, particularly in those partnerships with the resource industry. Um, and most, I think most Albertans know that if you were to pick a, a resource or, sorry, any industry in this country that you would describe as Indigenous, it would be the resource industry. I think uh, Indigenous people are double represented in um mining and resource extraction projects as a percentage of the workforce versus a percentage of the Canadian population. Um, so um, you've rightly pointed that out in here. The one last thing I want to talk to you about, because I could probably talk to you all day, but, but I'm sure you have other things to do. Um, healthcare. Um, it's, it's an evergreen problem that you, you just pick up the paper, you go on the internet and you see the healthcare system is in collapse and it's not a COVID thing. This is a perennial problem in Canada. So how do we fix that? And is a, is there room in your plan for private innovation to alleviate the load that the publicly funded system is bearing? Shalia, if I may very quickly on Indigenous policy, as I travel the country, uh, I realize how prevalent and, and still important and raw this issue to so many Canadians, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. And I think that um, that is certainly something that the Canadian government, that our future Conservative government should be thinking about. Um, we must be mindful of our history so we don't repeat the mistakes of the past, but we should not be uh, encouraging or succumbing to Justin Trudeau's divisive, divisive uh, rhetoric. So I think that the best thing we can do for reconciliation is actually improve the, the lives of indigenous people. And, and we can get a good start with water. We still have hundreds of communities around Canada that still don't have access to clean and safe drinking water. And, and given today's technologies where we can essentially drop water anywhere and make water out of air, that is inexcusable, which is why I'm committed to uh, making sure that every Canadian community 
it has water by the end of my first term. But uh, back to your question on healthcare, we have to acknowledge, we have to concede that Canada has one of the most efficient healthcare systems in the world. And one of the lowest rates of hospital beds in the OECD, my, um, my region of North York has one of the lowest uh, bed numbers in the countries and, the, and therefore in the developed world, that's unacceptable. So we have to own up to the fact that we're probably overdue for a major capital expansion as our population is getting older and, and people are living longer. We need more beds, but it cannot come without uh, administrative improvements. For instance, in the province of Ontario, we have more healthcare bureaucrats than family physicians. I read in the post uh, media last year that uh, Canada has about 10 times more healthcare bureaucrats than Germany per capita. So that's impossible. So we need to work with the provinces to reduce our administrative burden if we're going to look at a capital injection. And second of all, I am in favor of looking at a private delivery model still within the framework of the Canada Health Act. We should encourage doctors and surgeons to, to innovate and, and see patients outside of uh, the hospital or existing frameworks. We should encourage private imaging uh, and diagnostics. And at the same time, we can still remain within the single healthcare uh, payer system where uh, a private supplier would bill government uh, directly. And finally, on healthcare, I'm going to amend the Canada Health Act to make sure that we will not discriminate against any Canadian because of their medical status or their personal healthcare choice. You know, it's funny when people talk about healthcare, they just pretend like Saskatchewan doesn't exist. <laughs> Saskatchewan does this <laughs> all Quebec. the time or Quebec. You know, they do this all the time. They have lower wait times. They spend far less in Saskatchewan than they we do here in Alberta. They have better outcomes. And yet it seems to be that in the other eight provinces, the only way of delivering something is the same way that you keep doing it that doesn't work. So I'm happy to see that you sort of examined some of these Canadian success stories and are willing to allow replication of that in other places. Uh, Roman, how do people find out more about your commitment to Canada and support you as you try to advance these ideas within the Conservative Party of Canada leadership race? Well, everyone's encouraged to visit joinroman.ca, joinroman.ca and click on policy is where you can find the entire document, Commitment to Canada, which is essentially four pillars. Restore Canada's democracy, uh, uh, restore Canadian opportunity, make Canada a natural resources superpower, and reinstate trust in government. We have a record deficit of trust in government now. We've got to say what we believe and do what we believe is right. I'll propose a judicial inquiry into the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic, review the lobbying act and the representation formula, most importantly, restore and defend the rule of law. Uh, we are uh, running an excellent campaign. I, I think we have certainly influenced the conversation very much in the democracy direction among all other candidates. Uh, I would remind your um, uh, viewers that it's a ranked ballot. Uh, there is no vote splitting. They can comfortably put me, rank me first. And then uh, another, perhaps a more popular candidate who is likely to survive longer on the ballot than I am uh, after me, uh, although we do see a path to winning. And, but, but if we're not going to get there, then um, we ask that uh, your viewers rank us first to send a strong message of democracy to the Conservative Party of Canada and that we reward politicians that uh, say what they believe and, and put their constituents ahead of politics uh, join Roman.ca. We're one of the least underfunded, we're the least funded campaign, uh, but at the same time, we're doing great and I'm excited for the conclusion of this race. Yeah, you're sure punching up, Roman. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I wish you the best of luck. Uh, I, I admire how unafraid you are to advance these ideas because these are truly mainstream ideas if you take a minute to talk to the grassroots. Uh, Roman, thanks so much for coming on the show. Best of luck in the race. What you just saw was an excerpt from my nightly show, The Ezra Levant Show. Every weekday, I do a monologue. Usually, it's about half an hour. Then I interview an interesting guest, and then we read my hate mail or my fan mail, whichever is more fun. It's only available behind a paywall, though. That's how we pay our bills here at Rebel News. We don't take a dime from Justin Trudeau. But the good news is it's only 8 bucks a month, about half the price of Netflix, and in addition to my weekly, sorry, my nightly show, you also get weekly shows from four other friends here at Rebel News. So you're getting 36 shows a month just for eight bucks. I think it's worth it. And even if you're not quite sure, do it anyways, because 
We rely on viewers like you to keep us free and independent. I promise you I'll never take a dime from Trudeau. Just go to rebelnewsplus.com and click subscribe. Thanks.